Kids are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad here. <laughs> Bonjour, 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 and welcome everyone to another wonderful and fun-filled episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. How are you all doing today, people? Because I do understand that things might seem scary in the outside world, rather it be stuff like uh, the earthquakes that happen in Haiti that was absolutely devastating, or even the horrifying things that are happening in Afghanistan where the Taliban are taking over. But, in the meantime, while we can do what we can in order to make sure uh, things can be better with the world, why not have a little bit of a break right now and just enjoy some cartoon times here in Animat's crazy cartoon cast. Because right now, I actually have two major targets that I would like to go and discuss, or at least two main themes that we will be getting onto. Number one being Sony, and the other one being Netflix. So all the stories that I have for this episode, those will be the prime targets onto this one. Not necessarily a bad thing, maybe there will be some good things and maybe some bad things, but it just so happens that with this episode in particular, it will be a very Netflix and Sony-centric episode. And yet, oddly enough, considering the deals that Sony and Netflix has done in recent years, no, none of the stories actually have to do with each other, funny enough. But, with that said and done, I would like to go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all, are you ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me hear it, folks. Are you all set for this one? Let me hear it. Are you ready? All right. Yes. Ah, that's great to hear. I see that people are now prepared. That's great to see. And with all that said and done, it is now time that we shall go and get things started. And with our first story, what I'm going to get into, it was something that I kid you not literally happened in the middle of while I was doing the last episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. It was kind of like a breaking news that happened last week, like literally last week, but I feel like it is a, a news that even though I didn't have time to discuss about it then, I think now it would definitely be a good time to do so because it definitely is a moment that now people let the news sink in, they've accepted that this happened, so why don't we actually have time to actually go and discuss about it. Now, in a way, this is an update to what actually happened before. I've already discussed this before in Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, and there may be things that I will be repeating here that I've already stated in previous episodes. But now we might as well go and fully talk about it here because it seems to be pretty much official. Yes, folks, Sony now has Crunchyroll. Literally last week, the deal was officially made, it is set, and now Sony finally took Crunchyroll from AT&T that is worth nearly $1.2 billion. Now, for those of you who don't know what happened or don't understand what's necessarily going on, uh, this actually first broke back in December of 2020, where AT&T and the Sony Corporation have both made discussions about having an acquisition of AT&T's uh, major anime distribution service, Crunchyroll, which the big significance with that is that Technically, Sony does already have another major anime distribution company, Funimation. In fact, those two are probably the biggest of them all. The, like, it's either most anime fans would have Crunchyroll and or Funimation as part of their list of streaming service that they would have, considering that they both primarily focus on anime. 
But with those discussions that have been happening, especially when AT&T has had a very long history of debt and poor business management, where the pandemic really did hit them hard, and Sony has been continuously been changing up many of their business strategies, and they decided to be a lot more serious when it comes to anime, and they were really looking to go and fully expand on that market. And what better way to go and expand and pretty much pulled the same move that Disney did when they purchased Fox and they decided to go and fully purchase what what was their biggest competitor Crunchyroll now this did cause some alarm to the anime community and it did cause some controversy as well not to mention that not long after the discussions have started uh the u.s department of justice had to intervene to double check if this deal can actually be legitimate considering that there have been a lot of worries about how this could probably seem like a monopoly which i will get into that later but it does kind of seem like it. However, just last week, that thing completely changed where now the acquisition is fully closed and Crunchyroll is no longer in the hands of AT&T and it now belongs to Sony. So, the big question remains though, what is Sony going to do with Crunchyroll? What is going to be their big plan with Crunchyroll now that they actually do have both two of the biggest anime distribution companies in the world? Well, a lot of speculation has been going around that maybe they might be blending those two services together, maybe they might keep them separate. But it looks like the rumors are true, and yes, Sony is immediately going to go and put this as a high priority to blend both Crunchyroll and Funimation to make one major anime-centric streaming service. Uh, in fact, to go and read from my source here on Variety, we actually do have a quote coming from Tony Vincequera, the chairman and CEO of Sony Pictures, uh, to which he states here... <clears throat> Uh, Sony's goal is to create a unified anime subscription experience as soon as possible. With the addition of Crunchyroll, we have an unprecedented opportunity to serve anime fans like never before and deliver the anime experience across any platform they choose, from theatrical, events, home entertainment, game streaming, linear TV, everywhere and every way fans want to experience their anime. We also received a quote here coming from the big boss of uh, the Sony Corporation, or specifically the Sony Group, the chairman, president, and CEO, Kenichiro Yoshida, to which he states, We are very excited to welcome Crunchyroll to the Sony Group. Uh, anime is a rapidly growing medium that enthralls and inspires emotion amongst audiences around the globe. The alignment of Crunchyroll and Funimation will enable us to get even closer to the creators and fans who are at the heart of the anime community. And that's essentially the big thing that is going on, is that right now the deal has officially been made, and depending on who you may ask, this is either a dream come true or an absolute nightmare. And the big reason that a lot of people have pretty much been freaking out about this is because, well, yes, this actually does seem like a legitimate monopoly. But is it actually, though? Well, in a way, I would say kind of yes. I wouldn't necessarily say definitively yes. It's not like Sony literally owns all of anime. But when it comes to specifically international anime distribution... Yeah, Sony does have undeniably the grand majority of the stakes. Like, they actually do play a very significant role in the anime industry right now, where many anime creators will have to go through Sony, or most likely have to go through Sony, if they really want to go and expand their markets. If they really want to go and present their animes all around the world, then there's a very strong chance that, first off, they gotta go through Sony. Sony so that their streaming services will allow uh, that anime to be aired in there. Now, one thing I will say is that there are some people mentioning that some positives are actually coming out. And that is actually the fact that 
blending two of the biggest uh, anime streaming services together, that could actually be a good thing because now you don't have to scatter around and worry about owning as many different streaming services as possible in order to actually have your anime fill. You can actually just have one big streaming service that's just dedicated to anime and you could primarily go onto that if you want to watch some of the biggest animes out there. Like you don't have to scramble around on Crunchyroll to get uh, one specific major anime and then you don't have to scramble around onto um, uh, Funimation to go and find another. Like, if you want to have something where you can actually watch Dragon Ball or One Piece or Demon Slayer all into one streaming service, well, then Sony will get you covered by blending them together. However, I would say, at least in my perspective, that seems to be the one major positive thing that came out of it. The rest, yeah, it just doesn't seem to look that great to begin with, especially with the frightening factor that Sony, again, has the majority stake of uh, international anime distribution. Like, technically, anime doesn't need to go and distribute themselves worldwide in order to really thrive. Like, they could just, they, they could skip Sony and just stick their animes onto Japan and keep it Japan only, and they could be fine with it. But now, so, but still, considering how big the anime industry has become and how global it has become, considering that Sony now has officially really tapped that market by owning both Funimation and Crunchyroll, it pretty much goes to show that, yeah, they, they are a massive powerhouse and Sony could technically count as the biggest uh, anime company in the world. Even though it's just a sector of like their overall corporation, at least the anime division of Sony, now it is the biggest of them all. Especially when you go and consider who are their competitors now. Because they really are nothing compared to what Sony has as we speak, especially with the um, with uh, whatever streaming service they're planning by fusing Crunchyroll and Funimation. Because here's the thing. Technically, if you look into their biggest competitors, they are the streaming services that technically they do release anime on the side, but that's not a major priority. Like, uh, for example, there is um, Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu as well. Like, those are the ones that uh, they would go and distribute anime but they don't necessarily need it per se in order to thrive in their business. That's just like a side dish. If they decided to no longer distribute anime whatsoever, then honestly, they'll still be fine. They'll still be up and running. I mean, look at Disney Plus right now. Technically, there's no official animes that you can go and check out in there. Like maybe there are some, but none of the major prominent ones. Uh, but yet they are still uh, one of the biggest streaming services out there that has legitimately surpassed 100 million uh, subscribers onto that streaming service. Like, the only one that is, like, superior to uh, to Disney Plus in terms of the numbers and in terms of business is just Netflix. But still, the point that I'm trying to make is that, like, now, Sony's biggest competitors in terms of, um, of the business that it's trying to run with uh, anime and streaming services... Well, they're the ones that don't necessarily need anime in order to thrive in their business. That's just a little side dish that they would offer. And um, as for actual anime-centric companies uh, that would go and like specifically distribute animes, well, nowadays they would be way too small compared to Sony, and there's no way they could ever catch up to the leagues of where Sony is now, uh, especially with the acquisition of both Funimation Animation and uh, Crunchyroll. In a way, I think honestly the best way to go and describe all this is that Sony has now officially become the YouTube of anime. I think that's the best way to go and describe this whole scenario where in a way it's not like they're the grand, you know, it's not like they fully have a monopoly. It's not like they own all the animes and only Sony is allowed to distribute them all. That's not actually the case, but they are the biggest 
compared to its competitors. Just like YouTube, where technically, yes, there are other uh, websites that do function the same way, like Dailymotion or Vimeo, but none can ever be as big as YouTube. And especially, it's from their command that they would go and um, pretty much determine what would be a hit and what would fail and what would be the types of trends that they would allow to have access onto uh, their platform. And it's the same thing with Sony. Like, there are other, like, companies that kind of do the same thing as this, but they could not be as big as you as Sony right now with whatever they're going to call their streaming service, whether it be keeping the Funimation name or like find a new name or maybe like uh, kind of update the company where they're going to call it uh, Anaplex, maybe who knows. But um, yeah, there is a part of it where I don't blame some fans where they do find it actually scary because yes, now Sony technically does have the distribution rights to the grand majority of of animes that are out there right now like I like give or take around two-thirds of them and I do understand that technically Sony does not have the best reputation when it comes to the streaming service itself of how they are currently handling things with Funimation now I'm not accusing Sony or Funimation of being responsible uh, to the poor working tri uh, to the uh, to the poor work environment uh, that is currently happening in the anime industry and the poor treatment Treatment that the animators are taking uh, when they're working on animes and stuff like that, but it's just the way that they would go and handle the animes and distributing them and the streaming service themselves. They don't necessarily have the best reputation. And also, that is another thing that does make me a little bit concerned, uh, especially with this new streaming service that they want to try to plan, uh, especially when they want to go and try to combine both Crunchyroll and Funimation. And that would actually be the uh, price. Like, now that they are combining the two, what is it going to cost fans? How much is it going to be? Because l l let's do a little bit of math here. Because if you do think about it, like m a lot of anime fans out there, they would go either or. Like, I know there are some that are very dedicated and they would actually have both Crunchyroll and Funimation. But for the most part, a lot of them would just have one or the other. Very rarely would they actually have both. But let's say they do, uh, let's say they do have both now. Like, if they would have Funimation, that would cost them $6 a month. And if they would have Crunchyroll, then that would be $8 a month. And keep in mind, that's just with the regular plan. I understand that both of them actually do have like a uh, special premium plan as well that is a little bit more expensive. But let's just say they just go with the average plan for both. And in total, that would only be... $14 a month, which is a pretty hefty price when it comes to uh, streaming services. Like, not a, not the most expensive, technically. Like, um, HBO Max is, like, still $15 a month. And I know technically there is a cheaper alternative, but I mean, like, the full experience of HBO Max is still $15 a month instead of $14. But still, it, it like, $14 a month for two streaming services can be a little bit of a hefty price. So now that they are going to be combining both, uh, what is Sony going to charge fans? Are they going to go and just make it a little cheaper, like maybe do $12 a month or $13 a month? Or maybe they could go and reduce it to $10 a month. I think, honestly, that would be the best price and that would be the most affordable, especially for um, a niche streaming service, because technically this is just focused focusing on a niche market, just going towards anime and just doing $10 a month, especially with the massive collection that they do have right now. I think that would actually be a very fair price. But again, that would be up to Sony. We'll see what they will do. And may, but either way, considering how the regular, uh, the, the, the regular price would be just, um, $14.99 for two of them separately. If they do it just $10.99 and they want to do like a super premium thing that would be, uh, $15 a month, then that would be perfectly fine. That would actually be pretty fair considering the things that they are offering and the huge amount of content that they do all own. But ultimately, again, we will have to wait and see. But 
Yeah, this is kind of like I'm, I'm I don't blame anime fans if they are actually freaking out about this, because, yes, this is actually kind of freaky with um, what's going on right now, where we are witnessing what is mostly uh, a monopoly, where we are seeing that, yes, Sony is going to be the owner of both Funimation and Crunchyroll and that they will have the grand majority stake of the of the international animation uh, distribution market. How things are going to go with anime? Well, I, I'm not expecting like some massive changes right now, but this is something that, yeah, it's it, it's definitely a topic of concern when it comes to anime fans. And yes, the best thing that we can do right now for them is just to go and wait and see with how this will work out. We'll see how Sony is going to be handling anime distribution from here on out. We'll see if it will actually work with them. Uh, we'll see if the fusion could actually be more beneficial to the company or not, but... We'll see. I, I think that's the best thing that I could say. It's just, we will see, but I do understand the concerns. Okay, so, uh, with that said, uh, now that I've done and said that, let us go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about Sony officially purchasing Crunchyroll and that they are indeed planning on fusing Funimation and Crunchyroll? And especially if you are someone uh, who is subscribed to either or and um, like uh, any of the streaming services, like let me know what you think on the scenario. Okay, um... Let's see what we have here. Uh, this is good news for anime fans. I was wondering if Sony owns Crunchyroll. Uh, what's going to happen to upcoming project collaborations with Adult Swim's Toonami, like Uzumaki and Shenmue? Is Sony Pictures Animation going to make original anime series for Crunchyroll slash Funimation with anime studios? That would be great for Sony Animation. Um, I don't think so we haven't had any announcements if sony anime like if that would be the case then we would have actually had an announcement if sony animation is actually going to do some collaborations uh in terms of anime and stuff like that i mean technically sometime last week they uh warner brothers actually did announce that they are considering to do some anime works as well uh, but we don't have any uh, we don't have any confirmation if there is going to be some legitimate collaboration between uh, what Sony has right now with either Crunchyroll and Funimation and Sony Animation. I mean, if they are doing so, then we would have heard uh, some recent announcements that Funimation would be willing to go and collaborate with Sony Animation. Again, it's just something that we will have to wait and see. But um, for now, we can't really count on Sony Animation coming in uh, and helping out with uh, with the anime sector of Sony. I know it sounds weird because technically anime is also animation as well, but Sony Pictures lately has not really been in the mood uh, to promote Sony Animation as a full-on prominent brand that they actually do own. I'm just saying. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. Uh, as a casual anime fan, this is just bonkers. Now people will finally have their anime collection complete thanks to this deal. Sony is really expanding the world of anime like ne never before. All we need now is a Sony streaming service. I'm thinking something like Torch or Light. Does anyone else have a name? I mean, we will have to wait and see, but I mean... Well, like, keep in mind, Sony is not going to go and officially make their own streaming service. Like, you're never going to see a Sony Pictures streaming service that, like, that ship has already sailed. But when it comes to uh, this one in particular, I guess you could say this is going to be Sony's main streaming service that they will have. It's just going to be primarily focusing a lot onto anime. And, well, maybe not just anime, but it will primarily be anime and Japanese content content that they will go and localize and distribute all over the world uh as for the name i don't know again that is something that we will have to wait and see maybe they'll keep one of the one of the brand names considering that they are still prominent and popular like funimation crunchyroll or anaplex maybe they'll find something new but again we don't know uh let's see now 
As a, as a mild anime fan, I'm quite excited for the anime-centric streaming service, but as for the acquisition, I'm a little on the fence. It just looks like another media monopoly, which I'm pretty sick of. But my one hope uh, through all this is that uh, the new streaming service picks up something like Cory in the House. I mean, if Disney Plus isn't going to do anything with it, um, oh boy. I don't know how to break this to you, but, um... I think at this point, it's safe to say that the Cory in the House meme is pretty much dead, and I don't think people would be interested in Cory in the House. Uh, and the reason why I say that is just, um, well, I'm not going to go into specifics, but just look up the actor who played Cory in the series, and uh, you'll know why uh, Cory in the House is no longer uh, a memeable thing or a laughing matter. I'm, I'm just... Uh, I'm just warning you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some people, yeah, like some people in the chat while I notice you all know what I'm talking about and you guys are like, oh yeah, that. Oh uh -huh, yeah, about that. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so you all know what I mean. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, personally, when it comes to Sony buying Crunchyroll, I'm very mixed. On one hand, Sony has a great opportunity to expand on anime they own, but on the other hand, this is a bit of a monopoly where now Sony has two major anime studios. Well, not necessarily studios per se, but more distribution companies. There is kind of a difference. Honestly, I could kind of understand why Sony made the deal, because Sony really is the studio that is the most uh, desperate to stay afloat during the pandemic. Uh, especially if they keep delaying their movies. Oh, believe you me, we are going to go a lot more on that later. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. I think I'm going to go and read one more before we jump into the uh, next story. Let's see. This is probably unlikely, but, but now that Sony owns Crunchyroll, do you think that they might add in a few of their own small touches to any of the upcoming uh, Crunchyroll exclusive animes since Sony is a Japanese company and CR is associated with Japan? Either that or the people behind those animes still have full creative control. Do you think Sony's involvement will have any effect on High Guardian Spice? That, I'm going to be very honest, I don't know. But what I am expecting is that Sony will be running Crunchyroll the same way that they are running Funimation. That, or they're most, or from what this is indicating, they're most likely going to go and do a full on merger where they're just going to go and combine the two, and Sony is just going to be running that company the same way that they have been working with Funimation. So, if you want to know about how Sony will be handling Crunchyroll, then take a look at how they're handling Funimation, and, and uh, you'll most likely have your answer there. But yeah, that's pretty much the big news that actually broke out just last week, and uh, honestly, we'll just see how it goes, but um, hopefully anime fans will be enjoying their one mega anime streaming service. Alright, so, moving on to the next story that I have here, now... I know technically this is not necessarily a cartoon story. This is not necessarily animation related. However, as someone who is a major fan of this, this is something that I cannot hold back on discussing about. I need to let off this stream. Uh, not, not let off this stream. I need to let off some steam to go and discuss about this. Because honestly, I do have a lot to say with what is going on, especially when this is going to be a major impact uh, to one of my favorite shows that I am still watching right now. And what I'm talking about is regarding Jeopardy. Yes, for those of you who haven't heard, last week it has been official. Jeopardy has announced their new permanent host after the passing of Alex Trebek. And they have officially selected executive producer Mike Richards and Mayim Bialik. 
Now, for those of you who don't know, ever since Alex Trebek has unfortunately passed away uh, last November, they have been scattering around to see who would be the next host of Jeopardy. That's who they really want to go and try to find because they don't want to just quit Jeopardy altogether. They don't want to have like they don't want to have Jeopardy pass away along with Alex Trebek. They want to try to find a new heir to the uh, to the hosting throne. And they have been trying out a whole bunch of people like for this season of jeopardy uh they have been jumping from uh, special guest to special guest where for every two weeks or every week even uh they would try to go and find who would be uh the the right suitor to be the next guest host and they tried uh several different types of people rather it be uh contestants who left a legendary legacy in the show like buzzy cohen or ken jennings uh they tried out a lot of news reporters, uh, rather it be from uh, CNN uh, and NBC, ABC, and even uh, Fox Sports just last week. Uh, and they also tried out a few celebrities as well, including Mayim Bialik and also the fan favorite, Le- uh, LeVar Burton. But after careful deliberation and after going through each special guest and apparently some long research, they've officially decided they're going to go with Mike Richards and Mayim Bialik, which, by the way, I may add that Mike Richards is actually the executive producer of Jeopardy. And uh, I actually do have a few quotes that I would like to go and read here coming again from my source on Variety. Uh, first of which is actually going to be from uh, the big boss of the uh, television division of Sony Pictures, the chairman of Global Television Studios and Corporate Development of Sony Pictures, uh, Ravi Ahuja, in which uh, Ravi states here, We are thrilled to begin the next chapter of America's favorite quiz show with Mike hosting our daily show and Mayim hosting new versions of Jeopardy. Oh, (laughs) I almost forgot about that. Yes, the fact that there is two guest hosts. There are two new hosts now. How are they going to go and work that out? Okay, so. Uh, apparently the big plan that they are going to do is that the new main permanent host is going to be Mike Richards. Mike Richards, he's going to be the host of the daily Jeopardy that would keep airing uh, continuously through prime time. Meanwhile, Mayim Bialik, on the other hand, she's going to be the host of special Jeopardies. Uh, whenever they would have some kind of special tournament, rather it be like uh, college tournaments or teachers tournaments or a tournament of champions or anything like that, then Mayim Bialik is going to be the host of that. And uh, anyways, going back to the quote from uh, Ravi, I almost forgot about that. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, We took this decision incredibly seriously. A tremendous amount of work and deliberation has gone into it, perhaps more than uh, more than has ever gone into the selection of hosts for a show deserve uh, deservedly so because it's Jeopardy and we are following the incomparable Alex Trebek. A senior group of Sony Pictures television executives poured over footage from every episode, reviewed research from multiple panels and focus groups, and got valuable input from our key partners and Jeopardy viewers. So they, you know, they didn't take this lightly. They went and did some heavy amount of research to know who would they want to go and choose who would they consider as the best. Uh, But then... Uh, so they ultimately decided, of course, on Mike Richards and Mayim Bialik, uh, to which they also commented on the situation, uh, and they stated here, the first one being, uh, Mike Richards, in which he states, Never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined being chosen to step into the role of this magnitude. Uh, I am incredibly humbled to step behind the lectern and will host tirelessly to make sure our brilliant contestants shine in each and every episode. Alex believed the game itself and the contestants are the most important aspects of the show. I was for- I was uh, fortunate to witness his professionalism, intensity, and kindness up close, and that I will serve as the ultimate blueprint as we continue to produce the show we love. I am thrilled that Mayim is joining the Jeopardy team. Her academic track record and enthusiasm for the game made her a terrific guest host. It will be a privilege to produce uh, the primetime series with her as host. 
We also got a quote here coming from um, uh, Maya Bialik herself, in which she states here, I couldn't be more thrilled to join the Jeopardy family. What started out with my 15-year-old repeating a rumor from Instagram that I should guest host the show has turned into one of the most exciting and surreal opportunities of my life. I'm so grateful and excited to continue work uh, with Mike Richards, and I'm just over the moon to join forces with him and Sony. After all the conversations we've had uh, about this uh, partnership, I am just so ready to get started. So that's pretty much the big thing, is that these two are going to be the new hosts of Jeopardy. Now, to give you guys a little bit of a context, before anything, yes, I am a huge Jeopardy fan. To this day, I still watch Jeopardy on a daily and regular basis. In fact, uh, me and my family are such huge fans of Jeopardy that quite literally three years ago uh, in my California trip, one of the things that we have done and one of the big highlights is that we actually went to the Sony Pictures lot and we actually saw a few tapings of Jeopardy Live, which nowadays we are holding it much more dearly than usual because we actually got to see Alex Trebek do what he does best. And it definitely was quite an amazing experience and I definitely won't forget it. Uh, so yeah, I, this is all to say that I was a huge Jeopardy fan and yes, I was actually, I, I was watching every episode with every new host that they would have. And I could tell you right now, holy crap, am I freaking pissed with this choice? Like this is honestly terrible. Okay. First of all, I need to go and address the white elephant in the room because I know a lot of people might bring this up and uh, this is honestly something that um, I personally feel like uh, needs to be addressed, especially right now considering it is a huge controversy. And yes, uh, these two are actually in very serious trouble ever since they were actually revealed that they were the new get the new permanent hosts of Jeopardy. Uh, there have been some backlash, especially with uh, their past history, especially when it comes to Mike Richards, where he had some very shady controversy and a lot of backlash, especially with some of his past experience while working on The Price is Right. Uh, let me go and uh, read from my source. There is one sec uh, one section that they actually have right over here and did address this where it states here, Richard has also faced criticism for his involvement in past employment discrimination lawsuits involving women who worked for The Price is Right during his tenure as executive producer. Uh, details of his decade-old uh, litigation surfaced last week after Variety reported that Richards was in advanced negotiations to become host. And yes, let me tell you, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the things that they have revealed in there yeah they're pretty bad they are actually terrible and th these are the allegations that nowadays should actually be taken very very seriously and need to actually be addressed especially from the people at sony pictures considering that they're the ones who are in charge and considering they're the ones who made this decision that would be a big question we need to ask the sony executives why choose mike richards despite the fact that he has all that going behind him like i understand that it is a decade old that these litigations and these lawsuits have actually happened but still they are something that should be taken a lot more seriously than what people are doing right now and then there is also mayim bialik as well whom uh, she actually has some backlash at the same time for some of the past things that she has done. Not necessarily the same as Mike Richards, but she actually has a lot of yikes moments. And no, I'm not referring to the fact that she used to be on the Big Bang Theory or something like that. Now, even though she does have some very strong qualifications, especially as like a part actress, part uh, neuroscientist, but she has also written some papers that were extremely controversial. Uh, you might have heard about some rumors that she was an anti-vaxxer, but uh, that was actually because like years and years ago, like probably more than a decade ago, she actually did write a report that is very much uh, anti-vaccine where she spoke against vaccinations. But um, even though she has written some controversial papers, none could ever top what is possibly the most 
controversial one and the one that she actually got some major backlash it's the fact that she actually defended harvey weinstein well okay not necessarily defended Harvey Weinstein, but she would actually go and uh, she legitimately accused the um, p the victims of Harvey Weinstein and claim that they are clout chasers. That basically that they're just accusing Harvey Weinstein for the attention and stuff like that. So you can imagine how that is just a major bag of yikes right there. But one thing that I will say, though, is that I can imagine that no matter whom Sony would go and ultimately pick for the guest host of Jeopardy, I feel like this is going to happen no matter what. Like, whoever they're going to choose, that per that individual is going to be facing some backlash, and whatever nightmare thing that they have done in the past is going to come back to haunt them. Like, that is honestly something that I feel is to be expected. And yes, just like I've been repeating, it's something that Sony should be taking seriously, and they should look deeper into before making this truly official. I mean, it's not too late to go and back out before they could go and move move on uh, to choosing another host or something like that. It's not too late to technically redeem themselves. So yes, there is that factor that is also a problem. But the one thing that I will say that I am actually pissed off about is the fact that, yeah, those things are also bad. But one thing I'm upset, especially with the case that Mike Richards is going to be the new host, is that, holy crap, this guy is freaking bland. This is like, basically, this dude is who he is, an executive. Like, he really does have that executive presence, and he just feels, like, he just feels like he has no personality whatsoever, and he just feels like the bland white male executive. That's it. He doesn't have that same kind of personality or something that stood that makes him stand out, compared to Alex Trebek. And I feel, honestly, with the addition of Mayim Bialik, that really feels like a PR move just to make themselves look good. Like to say, oh, look, we also hired a woman as well. She is also a permanent host of Jeopardy, despite the fact that she's only doing the side jobs. Like, the only thing that Mayim Bialik is going to do is just the, the special Jeopardies. Those, like, rare Jeopardies that would happen only a few weeks at a time throughout the entire year, while Mike Richards has the main job. And also another thing I, I just want to add, by the way, just like on a side note, is the fact that technically Mike Richards is the executive producer. Don't you think that technically he would also have more of a say on to who would be a guest host in, in Jeopardy? I know technically it's the whole team at Sony Pictures that would go and uh, like try to ultimately determine. But technically, as Mike Richards is the executive producer of Jeopardy, don't you think he would also have a major advantage or have a bit more of a say onto this scenario as well? It feels like he's the one who's in charge of like organizing all this and then ultimately he decided he's just going to go and do the job himself like the big boss of jeopardy is now going to be the host of jeopardy as well there is a bit of that unfair advantage that he kind of has as well. You know, it's kind of like, I, I guess you could say, like, maybe it would be considered privilege or uh, it kind of like a business type of nepotism, even though, the like, no family uh, is associated with this. But you get what I mean. Mike Richards technically has much more of a greater advantage than literally any of the other hosts that did appear as well. So that's one thing that feels like it's kind of unfair with what Mike Richards is actually doing over here. Not to mention, uh, like, just going back to what I was talking about, yeah, like, the dude, like, I feel like he's the worst host because he barely has anything to deliver. In fact, let me just go on YouTube. Um, actually, I, I just want to show you uh, some of his hosting skills. Like just, like, just to show you what he has done with Jeopardy, and, uh, yeah, like, okay, like, I'm trying to find one if he has, uh, if there is actually a clip, like, just to quickly see, and, um, yeah, okay, I don't, I don't think so, none that I could directly find right now, I do apologize, I probably should have done, uh, like, should have been more prepared to go and do that, but still, though, like, 
as you could probably tell, like I probably have the same feelings as uh, John Oliver right now where, yeah, having Mike Richards as the host, it's just it's like it feels like cheating in a way, especially when like he just sucks as a host. He's just bland. He's just like he, he has nothing to really go and offer. And I mean, I'll, I'll say this, like I would be a little bit more happy if Mayim Bialik would actually be the host because I will give I will give her credit. She was actually one of the better hosts. In fact, I would probably go as far and say that she was probably the best female host among all the guest hosts in Jeopardy. Like she probably would have done a, a better job like to do to be a permanent host. And like I would probably get used to her style. Like she did provide some charisma when she would work on uh, Jeopardy. But the factor that she's only doing the side stuff, like we would rarely have her from time to time and we would only have Mike Richards, it just sucks, honestly. I'm not saying that I'm going to immediately give up on Jeopardy immediately, but I do feel like this is going to be the kind of thing where I, I feel like I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up in a similar kind of relationship like how I was with The Simpsons or Family Guy or The Nostalgia Critic, that eventually I'm going to feel less motivated to actually go and watch Jeopardy because the host is just boring and unappealing and stuff like that. And eventually I'm just going to grow like I'm just going to grow out of Jeopardy. Ultimately, I feel like that could be a scenario that I might not I might end up with because of this new host right over here. Now, I know that there are some people that might go and ask me, well, OK, Animat. If you really do feel that way, if you are strong with that opinion, then who would you say would be a good guest host? Like if if you were if you were in the position like in the top job at Sony Pictures right now or the like if you are the top dog at Sony Pictures Television, who who would you hire as the next permanent host instead of Mike Richards? Well, okay, first of all, I think it goes without saying I would definitely go and hire Ken Jennings. Ken Jennings has done quite an amazing job, and I would definitely go and uh, have him on board. If not him, then um, honestly, well, Buzzy Cohen was also another great one because he actually gave out a great personality. And I know that, like, as a Jeopardy fan, I am going a little bit more on a bias of, like, the old, uh, like, champions of Jeopardy. I understand that. But if we can go outside of that, uh, Mayim Bialik is also another great one. Uh, she was definitely fun. Uh, also, honestly, I might have to go and agree with the fans as well. LeVar Burton was actually a lot of fun. I actually did enjoy LeVar Burton as a guest host, especially like debatably amongst all the other uh, celeb uh, the, the guest hosts on Jeopardy. He's probably the most uh, enthusiastic. Like anytime someone would have a right answer, he would say like, that's right. It was like. Yeah, so, you know, he's like he has the 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 enthusiasm. He always sounds excited whenever someone has the correct answer for this. But honestly, right now with um with the choices that they do have, yeah, I'm just personally not on board. And I'm speaking as a Jeopardy fan, and this is something that I need to have this off my chest. And especially like I know it sounds pretty, you know, it sounds pretty crappy of me considering that I'm valuing my opinion on how they are as a host compared to the actual troubles that they are. And I'm not disregarding that whatsoever. Like the controversies and the past dark history that they do have. Yes, that needs to be looked into a whole lot more, especially uh, with uh, with Mayim Bialik and with uh, Mike Richards, especially and definitely with Mike Richards, since he is going to technically be the next Alex Trebek, they would probably have to look up to his. Uh, past history with uh, what he has done with uh, the prices right so uh, honestly overall i just feel like yeah this is this is just bad news for jeopardy like really they could have gone way better than just mike richards like even like honestly even if they just kept mayim bialik if like mayim bialik would just be the new permanent host that would be awesome but with mike richards nah man not a fan not a fan of this choice whatsoever. All right, so with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, how do you, like, if you are a Jeopardy fan, how do you feel 
about the new choices for permanent hosts of Jeopardy with Mike Richards and Mayim Bialik. Even if you're not a fan of Jeopardy, uh, l- let me know what you think on the whole scenario. Do you think Sony actually made the right choice on this? Do you think there could have been someone better? And if you if you feel like there is someone else they could have gotten, let me know what you think. Uh, let's see. I may not know much on Jeopardy, but this is honestly conflicting. Getting controversial people, one that is so bland, and one is one who accused Harvey Weinstein's victims. Uh, I would much rather get LeVar Burton or even Will Ferrell. Yeah, he was mostly there for Celebrity Jeopardy and SNL, but oh boy, those moments are also almost like art. Yeah, no, I mean, like... It is the real Jeopardy, so it is something that you do have to take seriously. And I mean, Will Ferrell is still a pretty heavily demanded actor right now, so he would be too busy uh, to do like movies and stuff like that instead of just hosting game shows. He's not at that point of his uh, career where he could just settle down and just do game shows for like the rest of his life. He's not like Drew. Like, he's not like Drew Carey, you know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, LeVar Burton would have also been pretty nice. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, the fact that I would have preferred LeVar Burton aside, Richards and Bialik are terrible choices. Uh, even if I was more of a Steve Harvey fan, Alex Trebek was a major icon who could be imitated, but never duplicated. Plus, Bialik's defense of Harvey Weinstein and Richards' lawsuit, kind of a red flag, but at least there will be one last appearance of Trebek through a Free Guy cameo, which I'm seeing tomorrow, so it'll be nice to bid him one last adieu. Oh yeah, like, honestly, I did get a little bit teary-eyed when I did see the trailers for, uh, for Free Guy, when I saw, like, he was also there, I was like... Alex, <laughs> you know, like it brings you back to the good old days of Jeopardy. Yeah, I think honestly, the only thing that this news is going to make me do is just miss Alex Trebek more because, yeah, things are not going to be the same. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Hey, Amy Farrah Fowler is hopes is hosting Jeopardy with Mike Richards. Sheldon would be so proud of her, lol. Uh, with that joke aside, this actually sounds like a terrible idea, and this would put a lot of backlash, and this might be the dark age of Jeopardy, if it is. I don't think these two should host Jeopardy because I'm afraid that people are going to have doubts for Jeopardy. Uh, I think the best host would be Dwayne The Rock Johnson or maybe someone special. Okay, I know a lot of you people are really going for, like, the major celebrities to be guest hosts, but you, you can't really go find someone who is, like, too big in, like, the, in, like, the, um, well, I, I was about to say the celebrity spectrum, but on, I don't know if that would sound pretty bad, or some people might take that the wrong way, but, like, you know, like, on top of the celebrity food, like, you can't pick someone who is on top of the celebrity food chain. You gotta go someone who's, like, a little bit lower than that. You know, you need to find someone who could legitimately have the time to be hosting game shows instead of going around working on movies and TV shows and all that kind of stuff. You need to find a celebrity who actually has the time for that. Uh, let's see now. Um, who else do we have here? Honestly, I am not a game show type person, uh, but I am not too pleased by the new hosts for Jeopardy. Having some people that have certain backlash is a very bad idea, especially for Sony's parts. Uh, but it could have been worse. It could have been James Corden or Ellen DeGeneres hopes hosting Jeopardy. Definitely not looking forward to this. Ooh. Yeah, okay. Well, I think, well, Ellen would not be possible because technically she has a bigger deal with Warner Brothers. So I don't think uh, Ellen would be happening. But, oh, God, James Corden hosting Jeopardy. Oh, that would be a yikes, man. That would not be a fun experience whatsoever. Uh, I, like, technically, I could see James Corden eventually hosting a game show. I think that's going to eventually happen when he's going to be less demanded for movies and stuff like that. But still. Oh my god, like, James Corden hosting Jeopardy, that would be a freaking nightmare and a half. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, uh, oh, uh, no, oh, I've already read you, uh, oh, okay. As someone who's a casual Jeopardy watcher, I'm honestly really not excited about this decision. I feel the combination of the hosts and the controversies these two have... Uh, have had in the past, I think this could really end up making Jeopardy suffer, and it's a disgrace to Alex Trebek's legacy. 
Yeah, honestly, I think this is going to be a decision where ultimately it might depend on the ratings. I think the ratings are really going to speak for themselves to see if this is going to be what people are going to demand from, um, like, if they really do want, like, Mike Richards or Mayim Bialik. One thing I will say, though, and this, this did actually just popped up in my head, that I could think of one person who could actually be a worse decision. And this was actually someone who was con who was actually a guest host. Like, it could have been worse. They could have picked Dr. Oz. Yes, there was at one point when Dr. Oz was actually a guest host of Jeopardy. And let me tell you, it was honestly awkward because he pretty much treated it the same way he treated it like his talk, like his uh, regular talk show and stuff like that. And I can guarantee you, like, Dr. Oz has a lot more shady and controversial stuff than Mike Richards and Mayim Bialik combined. So, yeah, it's true. It could have been worse but yeah honestly with um yeah like dr oz could have been a much worse choice right there uh let's see i think i'm gonna read one more comment before we jump into the uh, next story if we do have another let's see here um uh no not this one uh do we have another one uh, honestly, there could have been someone better. I might not have been a viewer of Jeopardy, but I would rather watch a better host than him. Yeah, exactly. So ultimately, we'll wait and see with how things go, uh, when they're going to be the official hosts. But, uh, let's just say I'm not going to be looking forward to Jeopardy as much as the days of Alex Trebek. Okay, so for the next story... We're going to be taking a break from, uh, from Jet, from, well, from Jeopardy, but we're going to be taking a break from Sony. And what we are going to do is enter the realm of Netflix because I actually have a couple of trailers to go and show you all. And for the first trailer that I have over here, we actually got something, uh, that is quite anticipated. Uh, debatably, it is the most anticipated animated film so far that Netflix has coming up. And I'm sure that many Many people out there are actually quite excited for this. Well, okay, well, yeah, like some people are kind of like pretty mixed on like what would be the response. Some are saying the Loud House movie and the others actually have the right answer. So every pony get ready because we are about to enter a new generation with my little pony. Well, a new generation. So let's go and check out the trailer. Once upon a time, Earth ponies, Pegasi, and unicorns lived in harmony. Why can't we be friends anymore? Maybe one day, we'll figure it out. <laughs> what the? <gasps> Hi, new friend! Unicorn attack! <laughs> ah! Is every pony playing hide and seek? Your son is safe now, ma'am. This isn't my kid! You're welcome! <laughs> I've got to get you out of here! Show me some magic! I can do this! Ta-da! You don't have any magic? We did have it. It just poof, disappeared. Hey. Hey. Ow. Izzy, we're going to Zephyr Heights. The Pegasus City? We need to find out what happened to your magic and bring it back. But the Pegasi are bad news. <laughs> Whoa, a unicorn and an earth pony? Okay, well this day just got a whole lot more interesting. We'll need glitter. Lots of glitter. <laughs> Yay, makeovers. I love makeovers. Gorgeous. Come on, every pony. Bring forth the ultimate challenge! I don't play. I win. Big talk for a little pony. I think you'll find I'm average height. It's all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. It's all right. Ah! It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Everyone feel it and jump on this hill. I'm so happy to see you now. It's all right. Oh, <laughs> thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. No photos. Okay, one photo. All right, ponies, that was My Little Pony, a new pony, which is coming out on tw September Pony. I mean, September September 24th. <laughs> My Little Pony, a new generation, by the way. <laughs> pony. <laughs> All right, folks. Yep, that was uh, the latest uh, feature film, the start of the fifth generation of My Little Pony. Now, I just want to give you all a little bit of a context. Uh, admittedly, I'm not necessarily a uh, brony myself. I did try watching a few episodes of My Little Pony, and, well, I understand why it has such a prominent fan base, but it was just something that I couldn't really get myself into. So, like, honestly, I kind of moved on and just did my own stuff. But I definitely, again, I definitely do understand why My Little Pony nowadays has such a huge and prominent fan base. In fact, you could debatably say that because My Little Pony Friendship is Magic had such a huge cult following, in fact, you could debatably say it was the largest cult following for an animated series in the last decade that it really did shape how the cartoon community is today. That it really did change up how people view both animation, how people view fan bases, and all that kind of stuff. Like, it really was a massive game changer. So there are like, yeah, even though I couldn't really get into the show myself, there are a lot of things that I do respect about it. And honestly, looking into My Little Pony, A New Generation, like, uh, let's be honest, we knew that this was going to happen because, yeah, like, it's kind of natural to see that um, there, there are going to be some times when things will have to change. And, like, the adventures of uh, Twilight Sparkle and Pinkie Pie and Applejack and Rarity and all those characters, like, eventually they got to move on and they got to go and pass on, to, uh, pass on the torch to new characters. And honestly, from what I am seeing with My Little Pony, A New Generation, I gotta admit, this actually looks pretty legit. This actually looks very solid, especially like, and, and, and actually, I'm not just saying that because like, oh, I could definitely see how like uh, bronies and fans of My Little Pony, like they would get into this because yeah, they definitely would. But even for me, someone who's not necessarily a brony, I look at this and I would have to say, I am actually very much impressed. Like number one, the animation, like, holy crap, this is, this actually does look great. Like, the animation is actually very solid, like, it has a nice design, and even updating that My Little, that, um, My Little Pony style, and actually make it look appealing, and actually make it look good for computer animation, especially with the way that it is all detailed and very well rendered, too. Like, this actually does look like something that could legit be, um, that, that could legit be shown on the big screen. And, like, just take a look at this. This is, like, technically the, 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 like, the Pegasus, um, place. You know, this is the, uh, like, the Pegasus city. And it, like, look at the details that you see in the city. And especially, like, the, yeah, of course, they would also go and, like, do little puns of, like, brand names, but, like, horsified, if you will, like, Z Heights, or even, like, a parody of the Sony logo where it just says pony. So, yeah, but still, it look, it definitely looks fantastic. It, it definitely looks like something where the animation has a lot of heft into it. Uh, like, already, I'm impressed by the animation. It looks great, but... Also, I will say, uh, the tone, actually very spot on. The tone actually does match to what we would already have in uh, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, where especially the type of characters uh, that we do have. Like, already I could say right now, uh, when it comes to, like, these two main ponies right over here, I don't necessarily know their names as of yet, but um, the main orange pony with the pink-purple hair, like, she does seem rem reminiscent to uh, Twilight Sparkle as, like, the, the type Type of main protagonist character that you would have with these types of films and with these types of stories but then you would have like the goofy sidekick and i mean let's be honest like this pink pony with the blue hair and the unicorn like she definitely has some very strong pinky pie energy like the way like the way that like her mannerisms the way she presents herself like 
Especially like when she plays around with the beans, like th this part right over here. Show me some magic. I can do this. Especially the ta-da! I know that technically Pinkie Pie is considered like an earth pony, but consider- well, then again, w with how she is, she's not necessarily an earth pony. She's more like a cartoon pony with how, like, cartoony that she can be. I am quite familiar with that, by the way. But especially, like, you could- like, she definitely has that Pinkie Pie-type mannerisms as well. And, like, you, you can even see that. And, like, even at one point, like, there's also another pony, like, where we meet up with the, uh, the Pegasus uh, kind of pony, the white one. Uh, like, okay, this one right over here, you could tell, like, she is full on the spiritual successor of Rainbow Dash. There's no denying. So you do have a lot of that familiarity. But not only that, but I will even say the humor is actually very good in here, too. Like, this uh, like this part out right over here, like, ju just play this again. Your son is safe now, ma'am. This isn't my kid! You're welcome! Like, I will admit, that was actually funny where, like, he saves a child, gives it to his mother, and the mom is just like, wait, th this is not a kid, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I will admit, that part was actually a lot of fun. That was, uh, you know, there is actually some pretty solid humor that they are showing overall, so... Honestly, this actually does have a lot of promise. So not only does it have a bit of that familiarity, giving us a smooth transition going from friendship is magic to a new generation, uh, but at the same time, like the whole CG aesthetic definitely gives it something that feels fresh at the same time. So honestly, I feel like with this trailer, it really is a step in the right direction for a new generation of My Little Pony, no pun intended. Uh, so far, like, the characters actually, you know, the, the characters do have a bit of that same charm that we've had before with some of the uh, classic My Little Pony characters. Uh, the animation is really gorgeous, and I, you know, honestly, it is kind of uh, unfortunate that it's only being released on Netflix because this definitely does look big screen worthy. And honestly, I feel like this does have... Um, a lot of promise honestly the only downside that i would give is regarding the story because i feel like that is the type of story like even though it does have a good message you know it's um a, you know it pretty much speaks about uh unity over segregation where the ponies are now separated and they must all combine together like yeah it's a good message but it is absolutely a very very predictable story in a way like the, like, the, this feels like something we've already been done. Like, the more I think about it, like, the more I feel like, didn't we just got this type of story already with Raya and the Last Dragon? That's the big thing about this, is that, like, this is, like, this is, this is My Little Pony and the Last Dragon. That, that's what it pretty much feels like with this plot line. But that's my, uh, that's honestly my only criticism. Other than that, though, this does look very promising, and I could definitely see how, uh, a lot of My Little Pony fans are gonna be very excited for this trailer. And if you you are excited for this movie to go and come out then just keep in mind that it is going to be coming out on uh, September 24th so mark your calendars on that for the new generation of My Little Pony. All right so with that said I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all how do you feel about uh, the trailer for My Little Pony, A New Generation. Are you guys excited for it? If you're a Pony fan especially, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. So, lay out your opinions and let me know what you think. Alright, ponies, what kind of pony you got on this pony? Let's see. I'm quite excited to see this movie. I love watching My Little Pony a few years ago, and I just had interest in the franchise again this year. I really love the animation and characters in the Gen 5 movie. I bet this is going to be fun and awesome. I'm going to check out the movie when it comes out on Netflix next month. Also, how do you feel about the actors involved? Well, so far from the performances that they are displaying, like, you know, they're pretty solid. I, I will say, the acting... It feels very nice. I mean, sure, we do have uh, a lot of familiar names here, uh, just to go back a bit. Like, yeah, we do have, like, uh, some names that we do know. Yeah, we got James Mar Marsden. We got Vanessa, Hudge uh, Vanessa Hudgens, uh, Hudgens. Hudgens? 
I, I think I'm saying her name wrong, but either way, uh, this is a fight that I feel like I'm not going to win. Uh, like, I am a little iffy on, like, Ken Jong. Like, I, I feel like, I, I don't know, I feel like I've I've been seeing way too many movies with freaking Ken Jong, and, like, can I can I just get a break from, like, Ken Jong, honestly? I don't know, he's just, like, freaking everywhere. <laughs> but anyways, no, like, so far from the voice acting that I'm hearing in this, uh, they also sound like they're providing a lot of promise as well. Uh, let's see what else we got here. As someone who is more of a casual My Little Pony fan, this trailer got me excited. The animation is very well done, and the characters are so expressive. Uh, the characters seem like a lot of fun, even the voice acting is solid, however I am wondering if they will keep the animation style and the same voice cast for the main ponies for the upcoming Gen 5 series for Netflix coming next year. Um, that's gonna... we'll, we'll see. That, I think that's going to be something that we will have to wait and see. I mean, I know technically there is, like, some people speculating that maybe uh, the main six are going to be coming back, especially, like, when we do have a little bit of, like, an Easter egg, uh, like, right, right over here, where you see, like, the main ponies room. Like, you look on the side, and here they are. Like, you got the main ponies as uh, action figures. So maybe in the future, we will see like the same kind of Kung Fu Panda type scenario where um, you see po where you see uh, the, the, the main character meeting up with the main six and stuff like that. That could happen, but who knows? Like we will wait and see with uh, what could possibly happen with that. Like it's a little too far ahead to know, but for now we just got this movie. Uh, let's see what we got here. I've never considered myself a brony, but this looks pretty solid. The ponies translate shockingly well onto CG. The storyline seems quite intriguing, and I'm actually surprised at how funny the trailer is. I guess I might check it out, but I'll, it'll never top uh, the fan dub series Friendship is Witchcraft. Somehow that series managed to give an episode uh, about pony incest a banging musical number. I've never heard of Friendship is Witchcraft. That sounds intriguing. I might have to go and look that up, actually, because, yeah, obviously it sounds like they're going with a full on, uh, uh, how can I put that? A full on, like, Game of Thrones, uh, twist to it. <laughs> yeah, like a, a begging musical number about pony incest. <laughs> like that, that alone, like, you know, it's, uh, it's undeniably, it's objectively gross, but dang it, I am curious as to how it is banging. Uh, let's see. No pun intended, by the way. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not, like, when I say that it is banging, I don't want to look into that banging. I want to know how the song is banging. Keep it, keep that in mind. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyways, moving on now. As a brony, this is pretty cute. No pun intended. Uh, for a title like A New Generation, I expect it to be like Star Trek The Next Generation reference somewhere. But no. Also, I love the joke of the uh, Donut Lord giving the woman pony the wrong baby. And also, not sure if this is a standalone or maybe this is canon to G4, but said, In the future! Uh, bet that makes uh, an interesting MatPad video. Oh yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, like eventually there there would be like that film theory that would probably connect uh, a, ne a new generation with Friendship is Magic. I wouldn't be surprised if MatPad would actually be working on that now. Uh, let's see. What else do we have here? Uh, let's see. Here's my reaction to the trailers. Bre <laughs> oh, bring out the ponies, baby! I'm pretty excited to see both these movies that are coming to Netflix. I really love watching My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. I'm close to watching the entire series three times. Uh, I do recognize the voices of the MLP movie like Vanessa Hutchins, uh, Kimiko Glenn, James Marsden, Ken Jong, and Elizabeth Perkins. I'm looking forward uh, to this movie and bro hoof to every pony here. All right, I'll read uh, one more comment before we go and jump on to the uh, next one. Vanessa Hutchins is a pony in this? Haven't heard her, uh, haven't heard her pony since, uh, the frozen ground. Anyways, I think this looks really cute, pony. Uh, the designs of the ponies are cute, really pretty effects in the animation. Uh, the modernisms are fine. The characters seem likable. I honestly think I'll watch this movie. Maybe not the series because I don't want it to deal with the fandom. Lord almighty, that fandom. See you in September pony. I mean, September pony. I'm sorry, that mistake just seems memeable. Make it a meme. <laughs> yeah, the release date of My Little Pony will be September pony. So if you want to pony with My Little Pony, a pony pony, remember to watch it on Pony Pony. 
Now, when it comes to the next trailer that I have here, moving on up to this one, well, this is another trailer that has received a lot of backlash. However, this is not like last week when I talked about High Guardian Spice and that the grand majority of the backlash is very much unwarranted because a lot of it is coming from anti-woke incels with an unhealthy hatred for feminism and all women. It's not like that at all. It's the kind where you listen to the backlash, you get confused, and then you watch the trailer and you're like, oh, that's why. Yeah, now I see why there is a problem here. And with that said, let's go ahead and check out the trailer for the upcoming Netflix series, Q-Force. Everyone, go, go, go! He's the best of the best. Our 2011 valedictorian, Agent Steve Merriweather! Now, don't ask, don't tell was repealed. I can stand before you as my true self. A gay man! There was a mistake. We just uh, recrunched the numbers and actually uh, Agent Buck, who happens to be straight, but that's not what's going on. It's legit. I respect your decision. At the very least, I hope this little incident won't affect my posting. I have the perfect assignment for you. Where? Moscow? Beijing? Got it. Our lives are passing us by. It's time to do something about it. We need to work a real case already. You know I love you, but I can't make any promises. We go rogue! This team is ready. You were so cool five seconds ago. You all uncovered an illegal nuclear arms deal with the tie to the federal government? I've never been prouder. Let's do this. If you mess with us, there will be repercussions. I built a search algorithm more powerful than Google and only slightly less evil. Wow. You will slay going undercover. I'm here to absolutely save the day. Thank God for you, drag queen. Thank God for every drag queen. But not actually, obviously. Hold up, I'm the head of Q-Force. Oh, you gonna cry? No, the only thing that makes me cry is that one Rita Wilson scene in Sleepless in Seattle where she, wait. Everyone look at the back of the plane. The thing about being queer is that... Yeah, pride, chosen family, we get it! The bombs, bitch! Oh, what's going on? I'm saving your life! No, you're touching my sack. Good job, Q-Force. Sorry, that's what everybody calls you, Q for queer. I'll make them stop. I actually kind of like it. Yep, that was Q-Force, to which that's going to be coming soon on Netflix, coming uh, pretty soon on September 2nd. And uh, just to say right now that not many people are fans of this trailer in particular, let me just go in and uh, quickly refresh this video, and let me just show you, right now the uh, like and dislike bar right now, you could see how it is uh, quite disadvantageous for Q-Force. It's got, uh, you know, it's got 2.5, uh, you know, 2,500 likes. That's nice. But it also has 4,300 dislikes. So, yeah, not necessarily a fan favorite. But according to many people, however, uh, well, like, uh, apparently the reaction that a lot of people are saying is that this is still better than the first trailer that was just released, and that one, holy crap, was a massive dumpster fire. Like, the controversy was so big that even I had to go and step aside and be like, yeah, I'll just save that for another day. And now looking at this, honestly, just by looking at this trailer, like, I'll take people's word for it that it is an improvement compared to the last trailer, but looking at this... Oof, man, yeah. I could see where the hate is coming from here. Because the, the big thing with Q-Force, like, the, the basically the general idea that I'm getting from this series, at least according to what this trailer is telling me, is that this is essentially Archer, but with gay characters. 
Like, that seems to be the pitch. Like, you got this action-packed Archer series going on that will also have some comedy, but except you got an overabundance of gayness. In fact, there is uh, an overabundance of stereotypical gayness. Now, by the way, before I continue, I should have probably started with this, but um, I, I just want to go and already mention this right now, that um, this will all be coming from a, uh, a straight cis white St uh, cis white male, yeah, straight cis white male. So you can take my opinion for granted or, or whatever. I'm just speaking out my opinion, but I just want to go and uh, mention that perspective just to give you a little bit of an idea. Like I, like technically, I guess you could say I am an ally. I, I guess consider like I am a strong supporter for human rights for the LGBTQ plus community, of course. But um, like d d th this is just to give you all a little bit of a heads up of who I am, just to give you a little bit of an idea. Like I understand like for queer people or for the LGBTQ plus community, like they have more like they would have more of an important say on this than I would. Like, I'm just a dude on the internet who's just expressing his opinion, so just thought I would go and put out that disclaimer to begin with. But anyways, uh, going back into this, yeah, I just feel like, honestly, with all these characters, I feel like their main trait is actually uh, their sexual orientation, rather it be the fact that they are gay, that they are trans, that they're a drag queen, that they're a lesbian, or, or whatever. That seems to be, like, their key trait throughout this entire series. In fact, like, even with the main character, that seems to be the only thing that he really is about, at least the way that they're selling it in this trailer in particular, that, yeah, technically all of them are very much qualified, uh, like, to work in the military and stuff like that, but because of their sexual orientation and the bigotry that is in, that is within the force, uh, like, they're kind of, like, handicapped in their position and stuff like that, but Honestly, with all the different types of jokes that they are presenting, it really is just one punchline after another that's just, like, all saying the same thing. Like, they only had one joke uh, to present, and that is the fact that these characters are gay. Like, look how gay they are. Look how, like, ho look how, like, LGBTQ plus that they are. And look how, like, they embrace their pride and, like, how they identify themselves as not straight. And, like, that seems to be the whole, like, more, like, the key thing that they try to sell. In fact, honestly, the best comparison that I can think of is um do you guys remember like that one robot chicken sketch is it's from like uh, like from their early years but i remember there's this one sketch where they they decided to do like a parody of sitcoms where they take all the sidekicks from like several popular sitcoms and they would have them all together in one room and i think it was the guy from will and grace that would just pop out and like he would like he would just come in and like they like he would just joke around like mentioning how gay he is. It's like he literally comes out saying like I'm gay, I'm gay. Hey, did I mention that I'm gay? Like that's the feeling that I'm honestly getting throughout the entirety of Q Force. It's like all these characters are just coming out like I am gay. Like like just like replaying it. Like you got like. Like, even with the main guy, he's like, he's coming out, hey, I'm gay! And even, like, like the other char- Like, even with some some of the other characters as well. Yeah, like, no, this part right over here, yeah, like, like this is, like, like, this is supposed to be, like, I'm gay. Or even, like, with dra- like, even with the scene with the drag queen, like, that's supposed to be saying, like, I'm a drag queen! Uh, like, you know, that that's all they are. It's just, like- they're just a bunch of stereotypes and that's honestly the feeling that I am getting and it's just overall like I wouldn't say that like I can't really speak for people to say that like oh this is offensive but honestly even as a straight person myself I feel offended watching this like because of the way that like it feels more like uh, like they're kind of making fun of gay people or it really feels like this is the kind of show that is like this is a straight person's perspective of gay people. That's what it actually feels like. That That's honestly the feeling that I'm really getting from the trailer that we are seeing throughout all this.
And honestly, I think the best way to do to go and describe Q-Force is that it really feels like a massively disingenuous series. That this is just Netflix trying to really capitalize on the current trend right now. Well, I wouldn't say trend, but on the current movement on trying to uh, treat the LGBTQ plus community the same way that straight people are being treated right now. Like basically to like this is yeah, the best way to describe it is this is that this is Netflix trying to capitalize on LGBTQ rights and that they like the way that they see uh, people like the, the way that they see the, the LGBTQ plus community is like how a lot of these major corporations view them, not necessarily as people, but just as walking dollar signs. They know that it is a lot more profitable to be progressive, to be inclusive and stuff like that. And that's why you would see them lean heavily on on being supportive with many progressive and like human rights groups. That's why you see a lot of like major corporations, rather it be like Netflix or Disney, that they would rather say things like trans rights that are human rights and black lives matter. And we support the LGBTQ plus community and all that kind of stuff. They would much rather say that than to say like any nationalists or Trump supporter things like make America great again or blood and soil and stuff like that. So honestly, this and with this right here with Q Force, I feel like it's pretty much the same thing that we we get with like these corporations. This is like Netflix trying to say we stand with the LGBTQ plus community and that trans rights are human rights, but really they're just doing it in order to to make a, a, a quick buck. They're just trying to cash in on the popularity of like the support for LGBTQ plus rights. And honestly, that's something that I can't really get behind here. Again, I understand that this is all coming from the perspective of a boo of a boob loving straight guy. OK, like I understand that. And again, I understand that my opinion is not necessarily as strong as uh, LGBTQ plus people that would have an opinion on this. In fact, I actually do recommend that you would listen to those people more so than you would actually listen to me on this subject matter in particular. Particular, but still, though, I'm just not really digging with what they are presenting so far. And overall, it just it, it feels disingenuous. It, it really is more on capitalizing on the LGBTQ plus community than it actually is to actually help out the LGBTQ plus community. So, yeah, overall, honestly, not a fan with what they, what, what I'm seeing right over here. Like maybe like then again, I could be wrong and maybe Q-Force could actually turn out to be a pretty good series and like who knows, maybe it could actually turn out to be funny. Maybe it could turn out to be good. Maybe this could be Netflix's answer to Archer. But so far from the things that I am seeing, especially when it has humor that is on the same level as America, the motion picture. Yeah, I'm just not a fan of it. I, I, th I'm, I'm not buying it. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be watching this soon. Okay. So with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about this trailer of Q-Force? Are you a fan of it? Do you disagree with me and you actually enjoy it? Or are you just uh, not really into it? And especially if you are someone from the LGBTQ plus community, let your voice be heard. This is your moment to shine and I would love to read your comment. Uh, let's see now. Uh, why? Why must this trash have such good animation? Uh, that is the only nice thing I could say about this, and that's it. This series is just joke after joke after joke about LGBTQ stereotypes. Just gonna slam the skip button. Am I crazy for thinking that this might be the only time the homosexuals and homophobes agree to hate on something? Maybe. But then again, honestly, even I would have to disagree with you. Like, honestly, I'm not a fan of these designs. Like, uh, th th like honestly, this animation, eh, it's not that great. I mean, like, yeah, there are some good things about it. It's not the worst, but for me, it's just like, it's eh. Like, that's how I feel about it. It really is just eh. You know, and actually, the more I think about, um, the more I think about it, really, it, it really, it, like, I, I feel like, 
Yeah, this this is going to be like the series version of America, the motion picture where, yeah, the animation can be decent and has a lot of very promising action that does look like it can be fun. But the, the writing is just so god awful that there's nothing that could just really justify any positives that it may have. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, rainbow capitalism, also called pink capitalism, homo capitalism, or gay capitalism, is the incorporation of the LGBT movement, sexual diversity, and pinkwashing to capitalism, consumerism, gentrification, and the market economy, viewed especially in a critical lens as the incorporation pertains to the LGBT Western and, uh, the list goes on. Yeah. <laughs> Case in point, just look at what Disney is doing. <laughs> I, I will give them credit, though. They are doing slightly better. I, I will admit the gay character in Jungle Cruise is way better than the gay characters that they've had before, at least in terms of their movies. But still, though, Disney is absolutely guilt guilty of that. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. Uh, this trailer looks very bland and playing out dull. I'm not really looking forward to this series and not because the characters in this are gay, but because this series look like it's going to be boring. I'm not really into LGBTQ shows or movies, but I do understand why they make this stuff. I would much rather, much rather choose MLP, a new generation and the loud house movie. And why did this show, uh, why did it show that one part where the main character is carrying that buff, that buffed hairy dude and all of a sudden it showed his nuts? Yeah, you know what? That's also another really good thing. And that, yeah, I'm not going to show this again, but that is actually true when you do think about it. There actually was that one moment where suddenly out of the blue that got like we ended up seeing his like we ended up seeing one of the characters balls. Like, technically, the, the, like, I call this a massive red flag. It's like, why? Yeah, actually, why is this on YouTube? Because technically, they did do that. So they are actually breaking some community guidelines over here. Like, uh, like seriously, this needs to be reported, actually. You know what? No, screw this. This is a major corporation. It could go eat a penis. I don't know if it can, if I can do this right now. I'm going to go report them. No, not share. Like, where can I do this? Yeah, freaking report. Oh, I need to sign in. Okay, I'll do this later. Uh, anyways, no, you are correct. Technically, this shouldn't actually be allowed on YouTube because they actually showed some legitimate text testicles. Cartoon testicles, sure, but they are breaking some community guidelines here. They, they, they must be. I mean, seriously. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to be honest, this is really disappointing. I honestly don't think it's that bad of an idea conceptually, especially when the Orange uh, Führer banned uh, trans people from serving in the military and a number of sexual assaults in the military being brought to light. Then again, I think Joe Biden did reverse that, or that thing did, was fortunately reversed. Uh, so I hope that the characters would be more than just their LGBT plus stereotypes. I like the character designs as that, as that actually look good and distinct from other adult animation. I can't say it's good animation. It's just good looking characters. Well, at least we got someone who is more positive on this. Uh, let's see what else we got. I have no idea what I just watched. As someone who supports the LGBTQ plus community, uh, I'm all more for gay representation, but not like this. If anything, this feels more insulting towards LGBTQ plus community, and um, it also is just unfunny. There are ways you can respect it and do justice to the LGBTQ plus community. Nickelodeon has been on a roll with doing this with loud with the Loud House, Blues, Blues Clues, and many more. Yeah, exactly. Like, and yeah, I, I guess that could be a bit of a debate if the concept alone can actually be done well and can actually be done in a way that can get support from the LGBTQ plus community. But the way that I see this right now with Q-Force is it's, it's honestly just hopeless. That's what it feels like. Let's see. Even as a straight man, this feels more like a stereotypical spinoff to America the Motion Picture than a legitimate LGBTQ plus representation. The animation feels cheap, the setting itself is pretty weak, and the characters feel more like a parody of LGBTQ than legit fleshed out characters, so I'm avoiding this like the plague. Exactly. Now, I could be totally wrong on this, but there's just a part of me that feels like this is the kind of show... Well, it's like I said before. This feels like it is made by straight people who, like, 
whom they present their perspective of LGBTQ plus people than it is actually done by LGBTQ plus people. I could totally be wrong, by the way. And maybe like the crew is prom is more prominently LGBTQ plus, especially in terms of who are in the heads, like the directors and the writers. But still, though, the way that I'm the way that it is showing this right now, it just feels like it's more crafted in the hands of straight people than it actually is of gay people. All right, I'm going to read one more comment before we jump into the to, to the final story. Uh, let's see here. Uh, did I? Uh, yeah, I'll go with this one. This trailer is honestly homophobic to me as a straight teenager. The animation is decent, but holy crap, this is just a disastrous alone. A star from the Emoji Movie, annoying jokes, and an absolute insult to the LGBTQ plus community. Capitalizing on stereotypes is just absolutely sickening. I'm just going to hit the skip button and I'll just stick with America the Motion Picture and on my block instead, since those are actually good. By the way, yes, I did like America the Motion Picture. Okay, number one, I got to say, no. <laughs> America the Motion Picture, no, man. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Like, honestly, if you liked America the Motion Picture, then maybe Q Force is for you. You never know. Uh, like, and I, and I'm just going to say right now, just because the fact that there is someone who starred in, um, the emoji movie, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a bad thing. So I just want to go and like emphasize that right now. Like, yes, I, I like, I, I know like Anna Ferris is in the emoji movie as well, but if she's also in another movie, that's not going to stop me from watching it or say that it is a bad thing. So yeah, I will admit this comment over here is a little bit, uh, a, a bit iffy here though. Like, yeah, I understand your frustration with what they are showing in this, but mm, still though, it's just, uh, yeah, but yeah, honestly though, if you are still curious, uh, regarding what they are showing here with uh, Q Force, then keep in mind that it is going to be presented on Netflix on September 2nd. All right, and with that said, it is now time we are going to jump on to the grand finale. And honestly, at first, this may not seem like something that seemed like it would seem all that much to go and talk about. But the more that this story continued, and the more that I did think about it, the more fascinating it actually really is. But then suddenly came a massive twist. A twist that actually occurred just today, actually. And what I'm talking about is actually regarding Sony. Yes, we're going back to Sony. And a couple of delays that they have with uh, two of their major sequels that they have coming up. Uh, one being Venom, Let There Be Carnage, and the other is Hotel Transylvania, Transformania. Now, of course, because of what is currently happening with the Delta variant and with the pandemic, now that the Delta variant of the coronavirus is now putting us in a new wave, some people are saying it is the fourth wave, but then again, nowadays, like we've kind of lost count on what's going on. Uh, Sony has decided, considering that they don't have a streaming service of their own, that they could just put their movies, uh, like, safely there instead of showing it on the big screen, what they decided to do is just do a couple of more schedule change-ups. Uh, first of which, there is the highly anticipated Venom Let There Be Carnage, where instead of releasing it on September 24th, they decided to go and delay it by a few weeks on October 15th. Meanwhile, when it comes to Hotel Transylvania Transformania, which was supposed to be scheduled on October 1st, at the same time as the Addams Family 2, by the way, they decided they're going to go and move it up to September 24th, the old release date for Venom Let There Be Carnage. However, they did state that the change is going to be temporary. And they are going to see how things are going to go with the Delta variant and if it would still be feasible to put Hotel Transylvania onto, uh, onto theaters or exclusively in theaters. Well, that apparently just changed because this is kind of like a breaking news. This literally just broke right before I started this episode. 
because just today, Sony right now has a brand new change of plans with uh, what they are going to do with Hotel Transylvania Transformania. And unfortunately, they do have to break their promise and they are going to go and move that film to Amazon. Yes, right now, Sony Pictures Animation is currently in talks with Amazon in what is stated to be a $100 million deal to go and move Hotel Transylvania Transformania, take it away from movie theaters, and instead put it exclusively on Amazon Prime Video. That seems to be the big plan that they want to go and do that and go from there. Uh, we don't uh, like uh, there is no extra information that we have as of yet that if they consider to move it to Netflix like they have with many of their other feature films. But it looks like Amazon has a, a bigger eye for Hotel Transylvania tra uh, Transformania. And so it looks like there is a strong possibility right now that they are going to go and move it onto there instead. So. That's pretty much the big thing that is going on. The fact that Venom has been slightly delayed by a few weeks and that Hotel Transylvania is going to be moving to Amazon. Or at the very least, is most likely. Like, now we're at the point where, like, maybe 90% sure that it's going to be moving to uh, uh, Amazon Prime Video. So, first of all, before we even get into Hotel Transylvania, let me first talk about Venom Let There Be Carnage, because it's actually very interesting that they did move to October 15th. Because the thing is, with Venom Let There Be Carnage, I understand the struggle that Sony Pictures had when it comes to trying to move the release date of that one. Because, after all, it is a Spider-Man movie. And when it comes to Spider-Man movies and superhero movies in general, they are extremely tough to go and change uh, the schedule, mainly because if you gotta move one, then you have to go and move all the others. Like, in the case of uh, what Sony has with their Spider-Man movies, they can just move Venom wherever they want in a place that seems more feasible. Because the thing is, they would also have to go and consider where would they also go and put Spider-Man No Way Home. And also, they gotta consider where would they put Mobius. So, they don't really have much, uh, you, you know, they don't really have much space of where they can put Venom Let There Be Carnage, where it could be evenly spaced out uh, compared to all those other movies. So, the best they could do is October 15th. And I could see that working for Venom, honestly. Not, not to mention, like, with all the hype that is going on behind it, <clears throat> excuse me, but also especially with the fact that if you do look back at the first Venom movie, that actually did very well, even if it does have an October release date, so um, there's one side of it that I do see that it could actually go and be fine with it, but then again, uh, there is also something that is problematic with its brand new release date, because there is a very strong chance now that Venom could actually be overshadowed. By whom, you may ask? Well, the fact that it is on October 15th, it is sandwiched between literally two of the most anticipated movies of the year. Before uh, before Venom, it's going to be No Time to Die, the next James Bond movie. And the movie after Venom is going to be Dune, uh, the next Denis Villeneuve movie. So these are two feature films that a lot of people are highly anticipated for. They're excited to go and see on the big screen or they're just excited to go and watch and what people are going to say about it. So they are very much excited for that. And do and uh, Venom right now has to make sure that they really deliver what fans want to expect from a Venom movie as well as delivering some surprises as well. They got to make the, the movie has to make sure it does it right and it does and it does it very well to justify that yes it like it could still do well despite the fact that it's got two major movies that could potentially completely overshadow Venom and especially in terms of its box office performance so overall um honestly with Ven so I'll just say now with Venom let there be carnage I feel like it's kind of a 50-50 situation where on one hand, I could see it doing fine, especially with all the hype that's behind it. I think it could actually do okay. But then on the other hand, I feel like there's also another side where if it does fail and Sony ends up losing money on Venom Let There Be Carnage, then I think it's safe to say we know why 
uh, Venom failed. Like there, there's all like we have a list of reasons as to why Venom Venom ended up becoming a major failure at the box office. But only time will tell. Who knows of what's that what that's going to be. But then we have Hotel Transylvania Transformania. The fact that for the fourth time in a row, and now it is official, every Sony Pictures animation movie has not been released on the big screen and instead decided to move on a streaming service. And this time around, going on Amazon Prime Video. Now, you might be wondering, first of all, why did Sony decided to go with Amazon and why did they not stick with Netflix? You'd think that with the great relationship that uh, Sony Animation has right now with Netflix, especially after providing them with the Mitchells vs. the Machines, Wish Dragon, and Vivo, you'd think they would probably do the same thing with Hotel Transylvania if they were stuck in a position where they would do that choice. Why would they go with Amazon instead? Well, one thing that I could say right now is that technically Sony Animation does have a history with collaborating with uh, Amazon in order to go and present Hotel Transylvania. And uh, one good example is actually with the third movie, Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation. And I remember back then when um, Amazon actually held a special event where in some selected theaters, you could actually go and watch Hotel Transylvania 3 early like you could watch it before its official release so they did actually go and do that so there already is that strong established uh relationship when it comes to uh the hotel when, when it comes to the hotel transylvania franchise and with amazon so that's most likely why they are more keen to go and make this deal with sony pictures animation maybe they beat netflix to the punch in order to go and actually have that deal happen now, what does that mean for the future? Uh, are we going to see it in other streaming services? Well, I think, unfortunately, because of this deal, it's... Uh less likely right now that um like in the future i can imagine that uh sony that sony animation will be spreading hotel transylvania into several different pieces like some will be on netflix some will be on disney plus and some will be on amazon prime but still though like we are in a position where like it, it very much is like drastic measures that sony animation has to do and i'm just gonna say this right now that when it comes to Hotel Transylvania, Transformania, I think, honestly, Sony Animation has done the right thing. I think right now, this is the best thing that Sony Animation could do with Hotel Transylvania, especially in the current position we are with this pandemic. Because here's the big thing. Say what you will about Hotel Transylvania. You can either love it or you can hate it, but the fact is... They are kids' movies. Their prime target audience is really no different than the, than the prime target audience for something like uh, Paw Patrol the movie that's going to be coming out later. They are mainly kids' movies, and their prime target audience is for kids. So why do I bring that up? Well, the thing is, right now, uh, when it comes to the uh, pandemic... Right now, we are, in, like I said before, we are in a position where we are entering a new wave and we are unfortunately seeing more cases and more deaths happening. However, movie theaters are not going to go down without a fight. They're not going to be in a position where they're just going to go back and close and, and like close their shops because they're a non-essential service. What they are going to do is that they are going to compromise and they will be doing things to ensure that they will stay open, but to also pretty much tell the audience that it is safe to come to the movie theaters and one way that they are doing so and there are a lot of places that like or at least an increasing amount of places that are actually doing so vaccine mandates they are going to be demanding vaccine passports for you to come in and go and watch a movie on the big screen okay so what would be wrong with that well the thing is you know who can't be vaccinated right now kids under 12 like, nobody has confirmed as of yet if it is safe for those children in, like, if they could actually get the vaccine. Like, we don't have any, and we don't have confirmations from, like, any, uh, sci uh, like, medical experts, from scientists, from the CDC, or even from, uh, the distributors of those vaccines, like Moderna and Pfizer and all that kind of stuff. 
So you can imagine if you go and put the two and two together, and, and, and I'll just say right now, even if they even if they have made an announcement that they will go and try to ask uh, governments for approval for those children to actually get vaccinated, it still won't happen until a very long time. So the point that I'm trying to make is that if that like if movie theaters accept to go and like do some kind of vaccine mandate policy for their cinemas, that pretty much means for family movies, they are screwed. They would be done for. And especially in the case of uh, Hotel Transylvania 4, if they stayed on that September 24th release date, they would like they would pretty much be done. They would pretty much be screwed. And Sony would just immediately go and take the L even before the movie would go and be released because their prime target audience would not be in the theaters to go and watch Hotel Transylvania. So that's why Sony would have to go and immediately take that drastic measure. And I mean, they, they, they it pretty much left Sony in a spot where they were left with one of three choices. It was either A, they would take the L and accept that Hotel Transylvania would bomb and lose millions of dollars. B, that they would go and delay the movie again to sometime in 2022, because let's be honest, there would be a better chance that the pandemic would be better in 2022 than some than literally next month. Or C, that they would give up on movie releases and they would just go and release it on streaming. That is also a viable option as well. And like, let's be honest, if the pandemic is something like what we've experienced last year, then we would be in a position where this new wave, it's going to get worse from here. And we are going to see more places that not only are going to be demanding mask mandates, but they are also going to be demanding vaccine mandates. And that, yes, we will be seeing more and more places that will demand vaccine passports. So honestly, it's the best move that Sony could do, at least because the thing is that way, like they won't be held responsible for like causing a breakout uh, where they could source it in one cinema where like they're like there's massive cases of covid that occurred because a bunch of people went to the theater to watch a Hotel Transylvania movie. They don't want to face that kind of nightmare PR. And also, especially this is the best move they could do financially, because especially with a deal that is worth a hundred million dollars they're pretty much secure financially that means they've already made a profit because uh i'm not 100 percent sure on what is the budget of hotel transylvania transfermania some people are saying it's like 65 million like it's somewhere around like 65 million or 50 million or something like that it's like around that range like this pretty much guarantees that this covers the budget of Hotel Transylvania Transformania and then some like they've all like Sony has already managed to make a profit with uh, what they have done with the movie. So uh, so honestly, I do believe that it is for the best that they would go and do this, and especially with a prominent platform like Amazon Prime. I know some people are saying that it's technically no Netflix, but still, Amazon Prime is still one of the bigger streaming services, so it, it, it's honestly for the best. And like I said, Sony already has experience with uh, collaborating with Amazon to work on like Hotel Transylvania-related events, so the, like honestly... This is the best thing that they can do, especially for the situation that they do have right now. Now, with that said, like there are a few things that um, we don't really know about. And one thing that it does make me curious and one thing I will say, uh, no, considering that this is breaking news about the fact that Amazon could be getting Hotel Transylvania Transformania, uh, we don't have any news related to like if there's a new official release date as of yet. So that is still on hold that we will have to wait and see. But also, uh, one thing that I would like to mention as well is that it does make like now it really does make me wonder about movie theaters uh, perspective on Sony animation because they must be pissed because this is right now a broken promise that they just had right now with Sony animation like yeah like it was already bad enough that they sold uh, the Mitchells versus the machines which right now has the position of the most viewed Netflix exclusive animated feature of all time so far um, they already sold away Wish Dragon they already sold away a Lin-Manuel Miranda musical with Vivo and now they just sold away Hotel Transylvania so I can imagine movie theaters might be like 
I, I, I feel like pretty soon, like especially with the way that movie theaters have been openly pissed off at companies such a, like such as Disney and especially with Disney. They might like I I wouldn't be surprised if movie theaters might end up with a serious grudge against Sony Pictures Animation or they might have a talk with Sony Pictures and tell them to do something about what Sony Animation is doing because right now they are completely disregarding movie theaters much more than Disney Animation and even a bit like even more than like debatably more so than Pixar as well. I know Pixar like they're doing the same thing as Sony Animation right now, but at least they are promising that in 2022 with stuff like turning red and light year that they would put it on the big screen and especially with the fact that it is such a dick move especially when there are movie theaters that already did show hotel transylvania uh, or at least the trailer for Hort for hotel transylvania transformania and what they did is show this moment which is now an absolute lie you know this part in the trailer Boy, that was fun. The only place to experience Transformania is in a movie theater. <laughs> oh, God, that that is funny. Oh, my God. This is one of the best jokes from Hotel Transylvania. Let's hear that again. Let, let, let's hear let's hear that thing again. The only place to experience Transformania is in a movie theater. October 1st. <laughs> Man, did, oh, boy, did that like I'll, I'll give Sony credit. Like they they actually did something that aged much bad like that aged badly much faster than I expected. Like, oh boy. Hey, does anybody know the Twitter account of poorly aged things? Yeah, someone send them this. Someone send them that little clip where they say the only yeah, the only place. Like that was such a douchebag level of a broken promise. And yeah, I can imagine um the hatred that movie theaters could have for Sony animation right now, it's going to be pretty strong. And I'm just warning you right now, even the like, I'm just going to say, even if the pandemic becomes so much better in 2022 and stuff like that, don't be surprised if you end up hearing the news that movie theaters are going to reject Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse 2 from being shown in theaters. Not because of the situation with the pandemic or with the virus or anything like that, but because of how movie theaters have such a hatred for Sony Pictures Animation with the way that they have been constantly rejected throughout 2021. I'm just giving you a little bit of a heads up. I'm not saying that it will happen, but I'm just saying this could happen because movie yeah because I, I'm I'm just curious as to how movie theaters might like that, that that's all I'm saying right now consider how movie theaters feel about Sony animation and how they've been treated throughout 2021 where they had four movies none of which appeared on the big screen so just let that sink in and just think about it and already I see in the chat while I've already scared so many people they're like no don't let that happen screen <laughs> but i'm i'm just saying people like i'm just saying like I, I know some people have disregarded but seriously think about how movie theaters feel about sony pictures animation because if they don't think highly about companies like disney right now with the way that they're handling uh their movies with disney plus then you don't expect them to think highly about sony animation as much as you guys like, I don't think they're in the mood to hear about how awesome something like Vivo or the Mitchells versus the Machines is. I'm just giving you a bit of a heads up and a, vi and a bit of a warning. Okay, so with all that said and done, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask what do you think about Sony's major move of moving Venom to October 15th and the move of putting Hotel Transylvania onto Amazon Prime instead of the big screen? Let me know what you think on this one. <clears throat> okay. Oh, crap. There was someone. Oh, there was someone beforehand. I'm sorry. I just want to go and um, quickly go back to the Q Force thing because um, someone actually does. Like, I actually do have a perspective from the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, someone mentioned for the Q-Force trailer, as a lesbian, this is disappointing and offensive, and to be honest, Disney had better representation, but I hope this gets cancelled and will last longer than one episode if the trailer tells about what the show is going to be all about, plus the animation is trash. Okay, just wanted to get that out of the way. Sorry about that, folks. 
All right, so back onto the Hotel Transylvania aspect. Uh, let's see here. Delaying Venom 2 is no surprise, so I'm curious to see whether the sequel will be a success or not. For Hotel Transylvania 4 being sent to Prime Video instead of Netflix, that was a surprise for me. Sending, uh, sending to streaming services is no surprise, but Prime Video? If this is because of the relationship with Prime Video on the uh, Hotel Transylvania 3 event, then I get why. I guess we won't see a Sony Pictures animation film in theaters until Spider-Verse 2 in 2022, since the last time we saw a Sony animation film was the Angry Birds 2 in 2019. Yeah, and that is maybe. Again, that all depends on how movie theaters view Sony animation. <laughs> that really does depend. Okay, let's see now. Um... Also, I don't really care to be honest for either film, but at the same time, it is still not easy to release movies in theaters, especially for people like kids going back to the theater, but it is for the best for Sony to do those changes. Also, excuse me for being off topic, but what are your quick thoughts on Idris Elba being Knuckles for Sonic 2? Um, I will admit, I, I will admit, even though I am a, I, even though I am a straight man, I will admit that Idris Elba is my biggest man crush. I will be honest. I mean, the dude, like he's a very talented actor and he is handsome as f and him playing as knuckles i gotta admit that is actually really awesome so even though i don't think as highly of the uh, sonic movie as much as many others i am actually pretty curious and pretty excited for uh sonic 2 because of that uh let's see now what else do we have here um do we have any other yeah okay we got plenty of others but uh um Oh, the government should really stop relying on the honor system by believing people who say, yeah, we totally got vaccinated. We could watch the movie without masks. Honestly, what should have happened is people showing that freaking piece of paper to prove that, yes, they did get vaccinated. Uh, we could have gotten back to normal much sooner if people hadn't been stupid and believing conspiracies on vaccines over actual doctors. You could have been able to see movies if you sucked up your pride and not lie. Yeah, honestly, I, well, yeah, I know that's another off topic thing, but I am definitely on the side of you. And this is why I'm a very strong supporter of the vaccine passport, because honestly, we are pretty much at the point where like w when it comes to this pandemic and stuff like that, we, we did get the vaccine and we shouldn't be getting a new wave because of the incompetence and the stubbornness of anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers. And we should be at the point where we should start rewarding the people who do wear masks and get vaccinated and punish those who are anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers as well. Strip away a lot of their privilege where they're not allowed to do anything that is non-essential and for them, like to like to try to kind of force them to stay at home and actually follow the rules. Because honestly, we're like, I think it's safe to say that we're pretty much sick and tired of these idiots like holding us back and we should really do something about it. Like, seriously, the only way things can get better is if we start punishing anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers. Uh, let's see. Honestly, I'm not that surprised that this happened with Hotel Transylvania 4. However, back when the movie got delayed from July to October, there was one thing that really made Sony look stupid, and it wasn't just the fact that it had the same date as The Addams Family 2, but it would have... Uh, it would have to contend with many of the other big movies like No Time to Die, Dune, Halloween Kills, Jackass Forever, Edgar Wright's Last Night in Soho, Ron's Gone Wrong, and many more movies. Um, it just made me more worried about Venom 2's release date. Honestly, yeah, well, to be honest, I think Hotel Transylvania would actually do fine even when facing a lot of those other films because technically... Again, Hotel Transylvania's target audience is much younger than any of those movies that you've listed, with maybe the exception of Ron's Gone Wrong. But it was absolutely stupid. Like, that was the one thing before they did the move to uh, to Amazon Prime that was kind of smart. Because, yeah, it was actually very dumb of them to release that at the same time as The a Adams Family 2. It almost felt like Sony Pictures Animation wanted to sabotage Hotel Transylvania Transformania. Uh, let's see, I'll read a couple more comments here. Um, I have to show my support and sympathy for American and Canadian movie theaters, which was uh, pretty much backstabbed by major studios, at least in France, the rest of the European Union. Movies are much more shown in theaters than overseas. The balance between streaming services and theaters is much more stable here in France. Believe me. Okay, I'll take your word for it. I, I can definitely believe you on that. Uh, let's see. We'll go and, uh, have one more comment, uh... Uh, let's see. I'll go with this one. Uh, or...
Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go with this one, actually. I went to see Venom in theaters and thought it was cool, but I never really see it as a good movie. And it looks like that Netflix is going to feel betrayed when Hotel Transylvania 4 Transformania moved to Amazon. Things are not going very well with Sony, except they're doing pretty well on sell selling the PS5. And if you've seen the Venom Let There Be Carnage trailer, what do you think of Venom's uh, singing in that one scene? I'm going to be very honest, I actually didn't see the trailer, so I don't really know what you're talking about, and sorry, I can't really answer that question for you, but with that said, I think that should do it for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. What a fun ride it has been, folks, and tune in next week for more fun-filled stories that we will go and talk about on this crazy adventure that I like to call Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. So with all that said and done, I would like to say thank you all so much for watching, thank you all so much for listening, and until next time, see you later, dudes!